Hey guys, Angie with AngieGensler.com here, and I want to welcome you to Freedom Friday, where I talk with successful entrepreneurs who quit their nine to five job to create a business and life they love. Now, I am joined today by Bobby Klink, and Bobby is the founder of Your Online Genius, and he's an intellectual property attorney focused on helping entrepreneurs protect their online businesses and to do so affordably. Now, before founding Your Online Genius, Bobby went to Harvard Law School. He worked at some of the most prestigious law firms in the country, and he was mentored by Supreme Court Justice Neil Gorsuch when he was just another lawyer. So please join me in welcoming Bobby to the show. Hey, Bobby. Hey, Angie. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, thanks. We're glad to have you. So before we get into your story of how you left your kind of your corporate job, can you talk more a little bit about what you do now, who you serve, and how you help them? Yeah, I'd love to. So I've got a couple of sides to my business, but they're both kind of focused on the same thing, which is I help uh, other entrepreneurs and specifically online entrepreneurs um, who are selling coaching services, information products, courses, things like that. And I help them get their legal ducks in a row, basically get things sorted out so that they're protected. They've got everything they need. And, and I try to do it affordably and I do it a couple of different ways. One is your online genius, which you mentioned. That's where I offer kind of a bunch of free training options. And then you can buy legal templates from me so you can do it yourself if that's where you are in your business. Then I separately I still have my law firm, Clink LLC, where I serve clients one on one in a traditional legal relationship where, you know, if you'd rather me actually craft it for you or me sit down and talk with you and give you advice, you can work with me there in a more kind of traditional attorney client relationship. So those are the two businesses. And in both of them, I work with the same kind of people, online entrepreneurs who serve people and are just looking to get themselves protected. Nice. Now, and for full disclosure, I am actually one of your customers. So for anyone watching, I can vouch for Bobby and his services. I actually became part of his membership where he gives uh, trainings and templates just specific for online entrepreneurs, which was a huge lifesaver to me when I discovered you. I actually discovered you through Amy Porterfield through the GDPR podcast you did, yeah, which yeah. was excellent. So I will link to that if anyone wants to access that. It was a really incredible training. And so I found you through that. And it was the perfect time too, because I was at this place in my business where I was really starting to grow. And I thought, crap, I really got to make sure that I'm protected and I'm not going to get screwed here down the road. And this, the services that you provide in the membership were perfect. So thank you for that. You're welcome. And I think you got in on the very ground floor. Mm -hmm. You got the best deal ever. Uh, <laughs> yes, I did. <laughs> which, you know, it isn't around anymore, but still, I mean, I, I like to say I still make things a lot cheaper than, than most of your other yes. alternatives. So. Yeah, absolutely. Because yeah, for us, the alternative was paying a local attorney thousands. And then I thought, well, even then they know nothing about my business. So I'm going to spend hours trying to explain it to them. And <laughs> oh, so it was I, I could tell you so many horror stories about that. I've, I've had people come to me, online entrepreneurs, multiple people who like went to a local lawyer to, to have them draft their, their website policies. And the lawyer said, well, I don't really know anything about that. But if you go copy someone else's and bring it to me, I'll charge you a couple thousand dollars to tweak it which I hear that. And I'm like, no, don't do that. Just like, don't come oh to me gosh. for trust in estates law because I don't know that stuff either. So, you know, find a wow. lawyer who knows what you do. Yep, absolutely. So for everyone watching who has an online business, Bobby knows what he's doing. So if you need that help, check him out. Okay. So <laughs> sorry, I didn't intend for this to be me plugging your, your services. <laughs> I'm not going to complain, but okay. yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> okay. So I want to dig back further into your story and talk about, you know, back when you were working for a firm, at, tell me what that was like. And at what point in your career did you realize like, you know, I think maybe I want to go out on my own. Well, so my story is kind of strange and funny and has taken a lot of twists and turns. Um, when I came out of law school, well, so actually, let me back up before I went to law school. I went to law school thinking, I mean, a very idealistic viewpoint of what I wanted to do and, and who I wanted to serve. And then I went to law school. And at the time, the legal market was insane. And I was kind of drawn in by these opportunities and the chance to go work at one of these big corporate firms. And at the time, literally, I graduated from law school and made six figures right away and you know, just made a ton of money. And this was 15, 16 years ago. So it's been a while. And you know, so I did that for a while. And, and I started at one of the biggest firms 
in the country or the world. It has 2000 lawyers or something like that. Um, but it was here in Washington, DC where I am now. But the problem was, I mean, I was representing big, huge companies fighting to save them some money here and there. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's hard to really get excited about that. Um, <laughs> and besides that, I mean, there are other parts when you go, when you're a lawyer and go to one of these big corporate firms early on there, you know, there are kind of glass or ceilings, glass ceilings, even for everybody, not just for women, for everybody. Cause if you think about it, if you have a hundred million dollar lawsuit, they're not going to let someone like me talk when I'm just getting out of law school because mm -hmm. you know, it's too valuable. So there were those problems. So I started at that firm um, quickly, I went to a smaller firm, but it was a firm still of about 50 people or 50 lawyers. And that's where I worked with then I just called him Neil. Now again, Justice Gorsuch is what we would call him. <laughs> he was kind of my first mentor there and it was better. I got more like kind of, you know, direct involvement with clients, things like that, but it was still big companies and big lawsuits. Um, looking back at the time, looking back, I now know that I was chafing about that the whole time that, mm -hmm. that working in this kind of environment where I was not my own boss was never going to work for me mm -hmm. at the time. I didn't quite know what it was. Um, but I mean, you, you joke about a nine to five job and we kind of talked about this before we got on as a lawyer, it was not nine to five. It was mm -hmm. eight 30 or nine until seven 30 or eight most days. Mm -hmm. Um, and that wasn't a lot of fun either. Um, so I did that. And then, uh, even there, because the case were so big, I wasn't going to get a lot of frontline experience early. So I kind of did this slight diversion and went and became a federal prosecutor, mm. which sounds weird because what I was doing before was these big fights about money. And then all of a sudden I'm putting people in jail for random things. Um, but it's actually a pretty typical, um, career path for people because it's a way to go get experience standing up in front of a judge. Mm. So I did that. Uh, and then coming out of that is when I, I first made a change. Um, and I decide what to do. This was eight or nine years ago, eight years ago, I guess now a little, oh, well, eight and a half. Um, and I decided to join this really small entrepreneurial firm. There were two other lawyers there at the time. Um, and it was kind of a startup firm that we were doing high level work, but it was just kind of three of us all right around the same level of seniority um, all getting to do everything and pitching in. And so that's when I really made the the transition. And then four years after that is when I, I left there and went and started my own law firm. Okay, nice. So what was it about, you know, working in that more smaller entrepreneurial firm? Was there something that happened that made you want to leave or was there a certain incident? <laughs> yeah, there was. I, I actually, <laughs> when I joined that firm, I made ironically, uh, what I, it's not really a legal mistake. It's kind of a legal mistake, but I didn't get my legal stuff in order, uh, which is ironic. Okay. A bunch of lawyers didn't get their legal stuff in order. I think that's uh, actually pretty common. Yeah, <laughs> I hear about but, that a lot. <laughs> so, so basically what happened is I joined them. I mean, they had started the firm, I think a year and a half earlier. I joined the firm and, and I was labeled partner, but I was not mm. actually a partner. So I didn't actually okay. have an ownership stake yet. And so I had all the downside risk and none of the guaranteed upside. Now, I say that for the four years I was there, everything was fine. I mean, I was treated fairly. I had no problems. And then my wife got pregnant. And I said, hey, we've got to formalize this. We've got to figure out a way to actually make me an owner. And that's when things fell apart. And we just wow. couldn't come to terms. Um, the sad thing is, I mean, so I, I left there um, when my daughter was three months old. And I'll never forget the night I made the decision. We'd had a call. I was holding my three month old on a Sunday night and I knew I would never go back to work there. Literally wow. my wife, my brother-in-law and I went with our three month old, picked up my stuff from the office, dropped off the stuff I had. Um, and then that was the last time I was there. I still talked to one of the guys, the other partner I haven't talked to since. And here's wow. the crazy thing. When I got married, he flew through hurricane Sandy on a 10 person plane to be at my wedding. Wow. But because we screwed that up and not didn't hmm. get a written agreement, we haven't talked since. And wow. so, you know, that was kind of my first lesson. And so I went and started my firm because I had to. Mm -hmm. And um, luckily, mm -hmm. I'm looking back, I'm very glad. I don't regret it because I love my life and I love what I kind of the turn I've made since then. But uh, that's the story of how I got here. Wow. That also explains, you know, when I've listened to you on your podcast, you're so passionate about making sure that you're protected. And even if, you know, it feels like a very amicable 
you know, you have this verbal agreement, you, you're really passionate about being protected and hearing your story. I'm like, okay, now I get it. I, I can see where that passion comes from. <laughs> well, and the funny thing is, I mean, I, I experienced it personally, but I've seen so many clients too, who've gone through the same thing. And mm -hmm. it, it is a common experience that people think, oh, I don't need to deal with this. I don't need to worry about this. And I always tell people, if it's a close relationship, that's when you definitely need a written agreement because the last Absolutely. thing you want is for your personal relationship to fall apart too. And so, you know, written agreements, even if they're simple, are a huge lifesaver for you. Yeah, absolutely. So how how did your wife feel about that? You know, having the three month old daughter, was she working at the time or was she a stay at home? No, mom? She, was, she was a stay at home mom. And she um, so she was supportive um, and, and she kind of said, well, I, you know, I always thought you should go out on your own or I always thought, you know, you should start your own firm. Um, and it was kind of interesting. I mean, realistically, it's kind of weird. I have a Harvard law degree, you know, worked at top firms, had been a federal prosecutor, had, had actually worked for a year after law school for a, a federal court of appeals judge. All of these things are the kinds of things you want on your resume. Mm -hmm. The problem was when I was leaving this, that entrepreneurial firm. So I reached out to some headhunters to see, Hey, is anybody out there who might want to hire me? I was at a very bad level, meaning I was mm -hmm. at a level of seniority where it's really hard to get a job because uh, okay. they want you to already have an established book of business that you can bring with you, which because of the firm structure where I was, it wasn't that kind of firm. We didn't have um, paying clients. We did mainly contingency fee cases. So that wasn't an option. So there was really no other option at the time, quite honestly. Then, I mean, literally two weeks after I signed a physical lease on a physical space, signed a bunch of contracts that locked me into certain things. The firm where I'd act had been before I was a prosecutor where, where I'd worked with uh, Neil Gorsuch called me and said, Hey, we think we might like to bring you back. Mm -hmm. And um, the problem was that that was the moment I had to make a decision. Um, and I decided against it. Um, again, I'm very glad I didn't. Um, it would I would have had such a different life mm -hmm. if I had gone mm -hmm. back there. Um, partly because I would have been working eight thirty or nine till eight o'clock at night at the office, traveling a lot away from my family. And and my wife liked the idea of me being home more and you know kind of having more control. And so she supported me. And you know it was tough. Luckily, I had some. I had a couple of things come in early that gave us some money to kind of serve as our runway and, and to help build things out. Nice. Nice. So what, you know, you mentioned you kind of ha had this fork in the road and your life would have been so different choosing your own business and choosing to take the entrepreneurial entrepreneurial route. <laughs> what do you think, you know, what do you now have the freedom to do? And what are things, just little things in life that you're like, man, like, thank goodness I can do this now because I'm an entrepreneur. Well, there's a lot of things. So, I mean, one of the things that I like to tell people about is in my daughter's life, she's now almost five. She turns five in a couple of, a couple of weeks. Um, I think I've missed one doctor's appointment is all in her oh, entire wow. life. I've gone to That's every awesome. other one. Uh, and we talked before we got on yesterday, we unexpectedly got some snow. And so I played fort with her under our dining room table. Uh, those are the kinds of things that mm -hmm. I can do as an entrepreneur that if I worked for a boss, I could do. Uh, yeah. I just wouldn't be able to, to justify getting away. And, um, you know, in, in my field, lawyers separately at these big law firms where I worked before, I don't really know any of them who are happy. Some mm -hmm. of them, you know, they like the money, they like the stability, but they're not happy. Um, yeah. <laughs> and their wives and families often aren't happy either. So I'm so glad I, I you know, to me, there's no comparison. It, it's the little things like mm -hmm. that. It's other thing. I walk my daughter to school most days and pick her up oh. most afternoons at like 430 in the afternoon, which again, I love that. Yeah, couldn't do if I had a, if it was working a big law firm. Mm -hmm. So things yep. like that. That is awesome. I know that's kind of same for me when I left my job. To me, it was those little things, being able to pick my daughter up from preschool, being able to be at the bus stop in the afternoons mm -hmm. when my son gets home from school. Like it's just, it's so incredible to be able to be at those times of life, you know, that working a full-time job, you wouldn't have the freedom to do. Yep. That, that's absolutely right. And, and to me, that's the, that's the trade-off we all have to decide on. Again, mm -hmm. um, I could, you know, now I'm getting to the point that it's, it's, it's getting close, but for the last, you know, four or five years, I could have been making more money at a big law firm. 
Uh, and it would have been steadier. And yes, they would have given me my health insurance and all those things. But the trade off to me wouldn't have been worth it. Um, and now it's, it's starting to really pay pay off. And, you know, the money, I think, is equalizing and I will surpass what I would have been making a big law firm in the next year or so. Nice. Yeah, it really is kind of a long term play, honestly. Yep. Yeah. So you mentioned health insurance. I know that's one question that a lot of people have when they're thinking about quitting their job. It's what do I do about health insurance? And there's so many options out there. So I'm curious, what do you guys do? Well, so we use the exchange here in DC. Uh, it's not a great option. Um, we pay a lot of money for a not a very good health insurance plan. I mean, it's a very high deductible plan. Um, but it's available, right? It's there. Mm -hmm. um, and so, I mean, that's that's what, what we have to do. I mean, that that's what if I have to say the the biggest drawbacks. My uh, in laws, my two brothers in law, um, are kind of are in town, and they were talking and they were complaining about health insurance. I mean, one of them's on the VA. I was like, don't complain. You're getting it for free. The other one was working at a bank, and I think for his family was paying. I don't know. 50 bucks a month. I said, don't complain. Oh my uh, gosh. I mean, maybe it was a hundred bucks a month, but I was like, don't complain. Uh, you know, cause I'm paying, it's not a thousand, but it's close to a thousand bucks a month is yeah. what my uh, premiums are. Um, you know, I could go cheaper, go HMO, but I, I just don't want to have yeah. to do that. But, um, you know, look, that, that's the good thing about the exchange. Um, whether you like the affordable care act or not, one of the good things, um, at least for now for us entrepreneurs is that that there is a market that you can go get that insurance. Yep, so. absolutely. Yeah, and we actually here, so I'm located in Missouri. And for us, I think it was going to be like 1500 bucks a month for our family. And so, yeah, so we actually found, heard about affordable. And I can't remember like the, the not affordable. I can't remember the term, but it's alternative to healthcare. And so we do that and it's, Third of the cost. Now is it, we is have it not, with like cooperatives or something like that. Yes. Yeah. So it's through Liberty. It's like a health share and everyone kind of pays in and that we have yet to have like any significant health event. So I cannot like attest to, you know, how it works once something significant does happen. But so far, everything's been pretty smooth. And one of our neighbors uses it and she had a baby on it and everything was covered yeah. and great. And so, yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, we last or a couple of years ago, I had, so I had in my law firm an employee for a while. And so when I did that, I actually had, a, I, I could do a plan through like as an employer and I had more options. Mm. Um, but since I no longer have employees other than myself, I can't do that anymore. Um, so, I mean, that's our, our problem here in DC is as far as I know, we have two options. We have um, uh, Care First, Blue Cross or um Kaiser Permanente. And those mm -hmm. are pretty much our only options on the market. But <laughs> I look every year, we have open enrollment now. So I need to check that out and see if there are other options available. But yeah, I think that is probably the the biggest sticking point for a lot of people when they're thinking about quitting their jobs and, and going on their own. But but to me, the the payoff, it just, it doesn't compare the what we talked about, the freedom that you get to be with your family, to be at home, to choose when you want to work. I mean, that's absolutely yep. worth every penny. Yeah. yeah. Well, and the, the other thing I would point out is, you know, those, my health insurance is fully deductible. So I'm not paying that full amount because a lot that comes off my top line revenue before mm -hmm. I have to pay mm -hmm. taxes. And in DC, what my, it's my federal tax plus 10%. So, you know, it actually, you know, it's not as bad as it would otherwise be. Mm, nice. So, you know, we talked about the, the good, good parts of the freedom of being an entrepreneur, but I'm sure that there are many moments where the fears tend to come in, overwhelm, <laughs> you know, doubt. So what do you do in those moments when you kind of start to freak out or get overwhelmed? Do you have anything that you do to try and pull yourself back and calm yourself down? <laughs> well, I mean, uh, some of it is, I mean, the biggest thing I do is actually just go for a walk. That's one of my, mm -hmm. my biggest things. If I just get moving off and it'll help. Uh, you know, but those pressures are there, right? And, and especially when you're kind of starting out and during the lean times and when you're trying to figure things out and, um, you know, the money side can be really scary. Um, one of the things that that helped for me on that was kind of adopting systems so it wasn't a problem. So, you know, being very systematic about the money and, and kind of using, I don't know if you the, know the profit first first yeah. method, but using that exactly. where I'm, I'm putting money aside for self every month. And I'm saying, Hey, that's not available for expenses in the business. So I have to figure it out with less. And so things like that, it's more doing stuff in advance. 
But I also do like to tell people because a lot of people, you know, deal with imposter syndrome and that seems to be their Mm -hmm. biggest deal. And so I tell people this. I've had imposter syndrome about the legal stuff in spite of the fact that my Um, credentials are sterling. So it just, it's part of life. And I remember that. And luckily I have some mentors who told me they deal with imposter syndrome and they are, you know, much further along than I am in the entrepreneurship business. And so, you know, I keep that in mind and just try to stay centered. Luckily I'm not someone who freaks out easily. So it's not a huge problem for me. Yeah, that's good. Probably a good trait for an attorney to have. <laughs> yep. Yeah. So I want to also ask about, um, it, you know, you had mentioned in the beginning, there's a lot of challenges when you're first starting out. So is there, you know, a big, I don't really want to call it a failure, but essentially like a failure or a big moment, kind of like an oh shit moment or something that you screwed up in the beginning of your journey, if you could go back, like that you could change? Well, there's a couple of things I would do. I mean, number one, I mean, some of it's before I even started my entrepreneurial journey that I tell people. So before I started my own law firm, I was horrible at networking, marketing, keeping up relationships Mm -hmm. at all. So literally, I I think I had a LinkedIn account, but it didn't even have a picture. I mean, that's kind of where it was before I started my (laughs) law firm, right? And so all of a sudden, I'm having to start from scratch and try to do those things. So that's one thing, like when I had a, a, this young attorney come work for me, that's one of the pieces of advice I gave her is I said, build those relationships now and mm. keep them up. So that's one of the things. Um, on the entrepreneurial journey, I wish I would have focused on building my list sooner um, because that now I'm finding is the most important thing. But it, you have to be conscientious about it. It's not just building a list. It's building and engaging with your list. And yes you know, talking with them, building a relationship and quite honestly, getting comfortable with the notion that some people are going to say, bye, I don't want to get your emails anymore. Uh, Because that's important too. Because if you're worried about everybody who unsubscribes, you're going to not put yourself out there. You're not going to make offers. You're not going to promote your stuff. You're not going to try to sell stuff because you don't want to offend people. So that's Mm -hmm. one of them. Um, And the other thing I would say um, is you need to actually do your research on your customer avatar before you do anything. Um, The biggest failure I ever had that I like to tell people about is when I first launched an online course, I had this grand idea. I was going to create this course and I hired um, a Facebook ads company to help me kind of build my list in advance and then to do the launch. I think total, we spent about $10,000 in ads. Wow. I had one person sign up and oh, she asked, no. for, and she asked for a refund on day 29, having never even oh. looked at the course. So oh, no. $0 back on a $10,000 spend. Well, looking back, I didn't do anything right. I was like, I know what my customer wants and what they need uh, instead of talking to them, <laughs> you know? So, <laughs> um, you know, I missed that fundamental part. Um, and that's a piece that I think a lot of people miss. They don't want to do the hard work of, of getting outside of themselves and, and actually talking to people say, how do you want me to serve you? And, and actually get those answers, I think is a big piece of it too. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's such a good point. And, you know, I want to go back to what you were mentioning about the list, because I think that's something I, is so important. And I think so many people are terrified of is when they first start building their list, they're terrified to email. And if they get a unsubscribe or a spam complaint or even an email from someone, it just scares them and makes them stop emailing, period. <laughs> and, <laughs> you know, I just the other day I had it was it cracked me up because so I'm a really big believer in the rule of thirds. And that's okay. a third of the people are going to love you. A mm-hmm. third of the people are going to hate you. And a third of the people couldn't give a crap about you either way. Yep. And I opened up my email. I was upstairs cooking dinner and I opened it up and I had an email from a woman replying to one of my nurture sequences. And it, she said, please take, please remove me from these emails. I'm like, okay. You know, then I go to the next email. I am loving these emails so much. This next person. Thank you so much. This is so great. This information you're sharing is so amazing. And I just laughed because I'm like, wow, there's the rule of thirds at play right there. Like one person doesn't like me. The other one loves me. And the one that doesn't give a crap about me, I, I didn't hear from them. So <laughs> Right. Well, it, it, and that's, it's a perfect example. And again, so I now joke, I'm in this Facebook group um, of entrepreneurs and one person coined the day she sends her weekly email as unsubscribe day. And I love it. And so literally like I, like every day when every day of the week, when I send my, my weekly email, I get in the group and I say, and I, and I, I post something about it being unsubscribe day. 
and you know now like it's um you know for at first i mean i would get huge numbers of unsubscribes and spam complaints literally people who'd signed up for my list like a week yes. earlier mark me as spam and these yep. aren't even promotion emails. These are, hey, here's my latest podcast. And I try to tell a kind of a funny story in advance. And then here's my latest podcast episode. And they mark me as spam. I'm like, okay, <laughs> you know, I guess you don't like me, whatever. Gee, thanks. But yeah, I just, you know, and another thing, I just got done with the promotion. And at the end, I sent a um, kind of the ask method to try to get insight. And I used the very controversial subject line, do you hate me? No. Basically to people who had not, bought just to get them to open and subscribe. I had a couple of people respond. One person in my space who knows, you know, this space, like just goes off on me about, I don't like people who are inauthentic and yada, yada, yada. Again, the whole email itself was very authentically me, but you know, I use that subject line to get them to open. And then another person said, I didn't before you sent this email, unsubscribe. <laughs> <I'm> like, okay. <laughs> but at the same time, I got I don't know. I mean, I got a bunch of people like writing me back. I mean, I had a survey that they could fill out. And so I had, I mean, I don't remember the number, but I got something like 200 people out of 3000. So what is that? Almost wow. 10% respond to my survey. So that's a pretty that's good impressive. response. Rate. Yeah. And then I had a bunch of people email me back and like apologize. I said, no, no, I don't hate you. I love you. And so again, it, it reaffirms <laughs> you, but you're going to lose some people, but that's yeah. okay. Yeah. And I think so much of the key is focusing on the positive ones because it's really, really easy to let the negative ones stick in your brain and and then give yourself this negative self-talk of, yes, I do suck. you know. And it's like, nope, you can't let that enter. Well, and the other thing I like to tell people is I say, look, we're in business, right? I mean, we want people to buy from us. I mean, yes, we want to serve people. We want to do all those things. But ultimately, even today, we're only going to keep doing this if people buy from us. And so if someone is going to get mad at me for sending an email that's vaguely promotional or only or not even promotional and going to unsubscribe, they're never going to buy from me. And so what do I care? You know, I, I'll let them go and it, it, you yeah. can't worry about it. Yeah. I kind of had to shift my mindset of, well, sweet. Thank you. Now I don't have to pay for you to have you on the list anymore. <laughs> yeah. Well, and again, so like that was like one of the things I did a, I did a list scrub recently where I was just trying to, you know, get people who hadn't opened anything in like three months, see if they want to stay on the list. And uh, you had to click a link saying you wanted to stay on the list. And one person emails me back and says, uh, I'm sorry, I don't click on links and emails, but I would like to stay on your list. Uh, hmm. Or she didn't even say that. She said, sorry, I don't click on emails too much or click on links too much risk. Didn't say anything else. Hmm. And then I sent the second one and she said, well, you know, I respond this. I responded last time I'm responding again. I hope you'll leave me on your list. And so I was a bit torn. I was like, well, if she's never going to click on a link, she's never going to buy from me because she'll never get to my webpage. But I said, I don't really care. I'm going to leave her on my list because maybe it provides value to this person. Yeah. And, yep. you know, so it is what it is. Yep. Huh. That's funny. Um, okay. So I want to go back really quick to the journey of growing your business mm -hmm. in, in that beginning phase. Was there ever a time in the beginning where you thought oh, maybe – maybe I'm not cut out for this, or this is too difficult. I'm just going to go back and try and find a job at a firm. Uh, I mean, yes and no. I mean, I, I don't know that I ever thought I had that option. Um, but when I was first starting, like in my, like starting a law firm business before I really shifted to doing the online business, and there were a couple of problems that I did. I, I did so many of the quintessential mistakes. I mm -hmm. tried to be everything to everybody. I said, you want me to do this? I'll do it. You want me to do that? I'll do it. I didn't niche down. It took me a long time to finally niche down, um, you know, and, and it was working with different coaches that got me to do it. Um, there were moments where I didn't know, partly because I am not someone who's ever going to go to a networking event and feel comfortable, or so I thought. You know, now that I go to these online entrepreneurship conferences, there I am a bit of an extrovert because I really love it. These are my people, I guess. Um, mm -hmm. But like going to an event with a bunch of lawyers, I, I, I'm the guy in the corner who doesn't talk. So, <laughs> so I had doubts. How am I going to build my business? How am I going to do all these things? And that's why I kind of started dabbling in online marketing. I, I actually got myself HubSpot certified early on. Oh, nice. Just to try to build my my law firm business, to try to market in that business. Um the funnier part, though, is I actually, when I started my law firm, I hated what I was doing on top of everything else. Huh. Because back then I was representing people in lawsuits. And that meant I fought with people all day, every day. Oh. And that is not my personality. 
Um, but that's what I've been doing for, for so long and I was good at it. And so I kept doing it and it was in working with a coach, kind of, I guess, a life coach or kind of an everything coach. After we'd done a lot of the other stuff, she asked me, do you like what you do? And I said, well, no, not really. She said, well, then why do we change that? Hmm. And that was the first time someone had suggested even more than a decade into this career where I had all this experience doing this one thing said, you can always change. <laughs> and so that's when I really made the change full on um, to focus on the online space and online entrepreneurship and all that. And that was a couple of years ago now where I basically focused 100% of my um, attention to that and said, I am no longer going to market myself as anything else. I'm going to wrap up what I have, but I'm going to spend 100% of my time on this once those things are gone. So that's that's the other part of my journey is you got to find something you actually enjoy doing. Yes. So yeah, that's really good advice there. Um, so I'm curious, I know that once you started that kind of the journey of serving the online entrepreneurs, you got some really well-known mentors, I believe. Did you enroll in B-School? Is that right? Uh, I did. And that was like, a so that was after a while. I mean, I, I did this stuff first thinking I, again, this is when I thought I was too smart to, to need mentors and doing it myself. <laughs> uh, I started just doing it myself. Um, the first year of my journey, I, uh, really focusing on it, I was trying to do it all myself. Um, it was a year in that I, I enrolled in B-School uh, and started really taking things more seriously. Nice. So what was that experience like being able to work with Marie Forleo? And then I believe you've had experience with Amy Porterfield as well. Is that correct? Yeah. So I signed up for B-School through um, Amy Porterfield, which meant I got access to the special group that she had an event and all these things. Um, and ironically, I mean, kind of going back to your question, um, uh, you know, I was having doubts about myself at that point, but I decided I was going to invest in myself and I was going to give it a try this year. Um, and one of the things I'd done, this is the first year I set words as my intentions for the year. Mm -hmm. And I set two words, giving and gratitude. And those were a huge shift. So I get into this group uh, with Amy Porterfield. And ironically, I was doing everything right without meaning to. Um, and there were a couple of things that happened. So before B-School, um, Amy Porterfield had a pop-up group to try to talk to people about whether they wanted it, to do it, et cetera. And she ran some engagement contests. And I said, she said she didn't come up with it. Her community manager did. Basically, the person who engaged the most in the group was going to win some prizes. And there was a prize each week. I didn't win the first week because they didn't announce it at first. But then the second week, me being the type A lawyer personality, I said, I'm going to win this damn thing. <laughs> and so, I mean, the thing was, there was only so many places I could offer any kind of legal thing. So I started being a cheerleader. And what I found was I actually know a lot more about online entrepreneurship than a lot of the people in the group. So I was giving them advice there and giving them things like that. And so it was funny, like the next week when she did her live, um, they, yeah, they said something like, well, uh, I think we all know who's going to win the engagement award this year, this week. And literally everybody starts typing Bobby, you know, in the group because <laughs> it was that obvious. Um, and here was the weird thing. One of the prizes you could get was 30 minutes one-on-one -on -one with Amy. Oh my gosh. The person who won week one didn't take that. I, I don't know what was wrong with them. I, I mean, <laughs> I don't know what they took, but I'm like, seriously, that's still available? Wow. So I basically said, well, I'm going to take that, but hey, I have a podcast. Instead of just doing a one-on-one -on -one with you, would you come on my show so we can share it with other people? Wow. So I leveraged that, got her onto my podcast, um, and you know, kind of built this rapport with her. Then- I'm in the group once B-School starts and I was just giving and giving. I gave like all my freebies that people would normally sign up for that were relevant to anything we were covering. I just put the PDF or a link to my uh, Amazon S3 account so people could just grab it. So they didn't have to do it. Um, and Amy and her community manager took notice. So at some point I get a, an email from Amy asking me um, saying, and it would have had a voice like a voice um, recording for me to listen to. I listened to it and it's her, she was launching this new program. And she said, you know, part of this program, I want to kind of walk through the legal stuff, but I'm not really qualified. So I was thinking maybe you could come on and be the guest teacher. And I'm wow. sitting there, literally I'm in my office. I ran downstairs, tell my wife, she's like, huh? I don't understand what this is. <laughs> Who's that? <laughs> yeah. So I did that. So she did that. And then when I got 
on the phone, or I think I responded to her, said, I'd love to, but this was right when the GDPR stuff was happening. Mm. And so I said, you know, I think you, you maybe, you know, I've got a launch coming up and also the GDPR is coming up and I'm, I'm going to be running a three part, you know, training to my group that I got to prepare. And she then responded to that and said, wait, hold the phone. You're doing a GDPR training. What are you charging for it? I said, no, it's free. She again was blown away again because I was giving. So that then is why she had me on her podcast. And nice. so that then led to that. And I can tell you this because she talks about it all the time. She now has me on retainer to help her team on legal stuff. Wow. Um, she's, you know, so she's become a true mentor to me. Um, and I actually get to interact with her because I did all the right stuff without even knowing I was doing it right mm. by just giving and just providing value. Um, and so that has been, you know, pretty fantastic. And now, uh, people are coming to me as an influencer rather than the other way of me going to them as an influencer, which is mm -hmm. kind of a strange, um, strange dynamic for me. Gosh, I love that. What an incredible story and such a good example. Cause you hear all the time people say you have to give, you need to give, but you know, sometimes as an online entrepreneur, it's hard when it's you in your house alone. And sometimes you're like, okay, I can only give so much. Like, <laughs> <laughs> What, what I, I like, love, I love this. Well, so what I like to tell people on that is the big shift there. And again, these are things that I've, I've, I figured out later at the time. I didn't even realize this. Um, but the big shift for me in giving was that I had shifted from giving as something you do to giving as something that is part of your being mm. to the, the be do have model rather than mm -hmm. the do have be model. Yep. And so to me, it has just become second nature to give. Um, and I give without expectation, without any, you know, strings attached. I just give. Um, so you mentioned my membership, you know, one of the shifts I made is now I've decided I'm giving the training away for free. People can have all the training they want. So all that stuff that's in the membership, they can now get for free. The only thing they have to pay for is the forms, the templates, because mm -hmm. I figure people need this information and I'd rather just give it to them. Um, and nice. so it's kind of become my real barometer in life. Anytime I have to make a decision, I think, well, let me give more. And that's worked out pretty darn well for me this year. So if people, if people want a resource on that, I recommend the book, The Go-Giver. The Go-Giver. Um, okay. I think it's a fantastic book that everyone should read. Awesome. I've heard of that one. It's on my list. I'll have to and put it's, it to the top of the list. And it's kind of a story. So it's not like a nonfiction book. I mean, it, there's a message, but it's easy to read. So it's, it's nice. a really great. Awesome. That's a good tip. Thank you. Um, okay. I'm curious. One last question before I kind of jump into your, uh, your top tips and resources, resources that you would recommend. Um, so let's think back to if someone's watching this, they're sitting in their office at a nine to five job, they're thinking about quitting, you know, what advice would you give to them? You know, with their dreaming about that freedom of entrepreneurship, what advice would you give to them? Well, so the biggest thing I, I mean, the biggest piece of advice I give people is um, don't make the jump just because you want to be an entrepreneur. In other words, there are some people who just say, I don't want to have a boss. And they think that's a big enough why. I think you need to have a deeper why. And the reason why I say that is it's easy for me to get up and, and give because I'm getting to interact with people that I love interacting with, mm -hmm. meaning mm -hmm. I am helping online entrepreneurs and I feel like I play some small role in all the good they're doing for the world. And that feeds me and gives a fire to me. If I didn't like what I was doing, it would be a heck of a lot harder to give, to, to you know work over the weekends when you're going to have to do that, especially when you start out when you're going to be the chief cook and bottle washer and you're going to do everything. <laughs> I mean, you've got to love and have a real why that's connected to what you do. That's my belief. You, you've got to do that or you're not going to be successful. I mean, you might have short-term success, but you're not going to over the long term. So find your why uh, and, and then be intentional about it and make the jump. Nice. I love that. Okay. So I want to jump into kind of an inside look at some of your top tips and resources. So when you need to churn out some work, you need to get some serious shit done. Is there something that you listen to or an app that you use? Uh, I have a couple of things. I mean, I have focus at will, which is an app. Um, that's one of the things. The other thing I will do is um, I actually just, I have like some 
what is it, the Google Home, and I will just ask, hey, Google, play relaxing music, and it plays mm -hmm. a Pandora station called Relaxing Music Radio, I think, which is kind of funny nice. when you listen to it. It's like popular songs that you know but played instrumental with no yeah. – <laughs> yeah. so it's kind of weird when you listen to it, but it, it puts me in the tone. But also I, I try to get up and move because um, uh, if I sit at my desk all day, I end up not being very productive. Mm. And the other thing, quite honestly, what I found, I have one keystone habit, which if I do it, everything else falls in line. And that's mm. to get my get my ass out of bed and out the door at five o'clock for a couple hours of running and walking. And if I do that, the, the day falls into place. If I don't, everything goes to hell. Oh, nice. I love that you know that. I love that you know whatever that keystone habit is. And I mean, it's funny, it's everything. It affects like when I'm doing that, I'm not tempted to eat bad food. I'm not nothing. And I can get mm. stuff done when I don't all of a sudden I want pizza. I want donuts and, and I want to do nothing. It, that one thing I've discovered is my true keystone habit. That's awesome. Okay. So what about, let's say you gave a one great book recommendation. Are there any other books or podcasts you can recommend your own as well that you would recommend to fellow entrepreneurs? <laughs> well, so, I mean, look, I, I think my podcast is good for people who are kind of starting out because you're often going to hear me talk about, you know, I, I'm kind of closer to where you are if you're starting out than listening to big people, but I love Amy Porterfield's podcast. I love, um, you know, I, I love James Wedmore's podcast. I love, um, Rick Mulready's podcast. If mm -hmm. you're thinking about pod, uh, Facebook ads or marketing, um, you know, when I first started, I loved entrepreneur on fire. Um, mm -hmm. I don't listen to it as much as I used to. So those are some podcasts that I listen to all the time. There's others, but those are the ones that, um, kind of off the top of my head, I think about books. There's a few I recommend, um, to, to really learn the space, I recommend Russell Brunson's books, Expert Secrets and Dot Com Secrets. I think those give you a good uh, kind of base in things. Uh, from there, the other things I would recommend are copywriting books and not the legal, mm -hmm. the writing mm -hmm. part. Um, yeah. That stuff is hugely important. Um, we have to be good copywriters ultimately. And so I would pick up, I've got um, Ray Edwards' book. Um, I think it's called How to Write copy that sells or something like that. Mm -hmm. I actually have uh, the ad week copywriting handbook, which okay. is a book. I mean, it's written by a guy who like used to write direct sales ads, like that they would put in newspapers, oh, but nice. he, he yeah. walks through a lot of copywriting basics and concepts. Um, so I would kind of devour anything about copywriting. Nice. That's awesome. Okay. Let's see. Uh, do you have a productivity tip? Uh, one. <laughs> well, um, my bet, I mean, honestly, to me, it's just, you know, you got to just get shit done. You just have to do it. Um, you know, you Knock can, you know, I mean, there's all these things and, and a, a lot of what I'm realizing. So what I, no planner is going to save you. Mm, uh, mm -hmm. no app is going to save you. You ultimately have to do it. I mean, there's a couple of things I think that'll help you. Number one, don't, don't make a to-do list of everything you have to do. Focus on what are the two or three <laughs> big things you have to do uh, and focus on those and put your attention on that. Um, I'm currently trying out and, and trying to use the 12 week year model. I don't know if you know that, um, uh -huh. which you know is kind of about this, but um, you know, I think the key is to separate the important from the non-important and worry about the important and let the other stuff mm -hmm. um, slide if you have to. Yep. I think, I mean, that's an incredible tip. That's one thing I've had to learn too as an entrepreneur. And I think it's so important because there's a million balls in the air, a million things you could be doing, but yeah, you got to narrow it down and focus on the two or three big ones. But the other thing I would say is sometimes you need to just unplug. Like I was literally <laughs> uh, last week, I think it was or earlier this week, I'm, earlier this week, I, I, I was having a Facebook message back and forth with someone. And I basically openly told her, I'm like, I, right now I'm trying to not write an email because I'd been sitting there banging my head trying to write, you know, this promo sequence for a while I said, I just need a break. So, you know, sometimes it, it's just that simple. Maybe it's go for a walk. Maybe it's, you know, go mm. watch your favorite TV episode to take your mind off of it. Every once in a while is worthwhile. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. And then last one, do you have a favorite quote or mantra that you live by? Uh, yeah. Don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. Oh, um, I like that. The concept is, you know, and there's a lot of varieties of this. Um, so Brooke Castillo says you can do B minus work. Uh -huh. I, can't, I can't do B minus work. I'll never be happy with B minus work, but I have to accept that it's not going to be A plus work. Mm -hmm. And part of that means, you know what? Sometimes my emails have typos in them. 
and not because I want to, I mean, and I read them multiple times, but I'm not going to, you know, at some point it's not worth me reading it one last time. Um, it's more important to get it out there in the world. Um, mm-hmm. and what I found is people are forgiving. People understand that it makes you human. Yep. Um, if you wait for it to be perfect, it's never going to happen. Um, you know, there's also a patent quote that, uh, you know, perf- a, a perfect or a good plan executed violently today is better than a perfect plan sitting on the shelf. Mm. Um, and so it's the same concept that a lot of people teach. Yep. I love that. You know, that's really similar to my mantra, which is perseverance, not perfection is yep. the key to success. Yep. Exactly. Yep. It's, it's all the same concept. Just, just, you know, yep. take a step. Don't worry about it being perfect. Just take action. Yep. yep. Well, Bobby, thank you so much for sharing your story with us and your wisdom. And I really appreciate all the resources that you shared. So I will have links to everything up on a show notes page. I'll have that up within the next probably 24 hours. So if you guys are watching this as a replay, um, you can have, I'll have, add that link after the fact, and you can check out all the links that Bobby shared. And then Bobby, I believe you have a special gift, but I also want to give you a chance to share with everyone how they can connect with you and learn from you. Well, so right as we're recording this right now, you can find me pretty much anywhere online under your online genius. So that's where I am on Instagram, on Facebook, search it. That's my business. And you'll find um, things from there. Um, I say as we are now, because one of the things that a lot of people have been pushing me to do, and I'm probably going to do is rebrand and just use my name. And it's just going to be Bobby Clank. But for now, it's your online genius. Um, so that's where you can find me. Um, we were talking about, I need to get better at Instagram. I was good for a while. And, and, but you know, that, that's really me. So if you DM your online genius on Instagram, you're talking to me, not someone else. Um, but so that's the one place, but also you mentioned the freebie. So, um, I have what I call the online genius Academy. It's got all of those training videos. It's like 30 training videos that kind of walk you through the legal basics that you need to understand. And Angie, you know this stuff. It's the stuff that's in the membership and then a few mm-hmm. others. Uh, so you can get that. Access is absolutely free. You go to youronlinegenius.com forward slash academy. So again, it's youronlinegenius.com forward slash academy. And it'll take you there. You can sign up. So it's got all the training videos. And then I also have links there. Like in each lesson, I put links to podcast episodes of mine that are relevant. Um, if there's a, a template that would apply to that lesson, I put a link. So if someone wants to grab that, they can do that. So that's my ultimate freebie for people. Wow. That is incredible. Thank you so much for that. That is so generous. A good demonstration of you giving again. Um, I appreciate that. So I will put a link below this video. I'll have a link in the show notes. So guys, this is incredible. I can vouch for Bobby's trainings. They are so helpful. He knows what he's talking about. So make sure you sign up for that because you will not be disappointed. So thank you so much, Bobby. It was great to have you on the show today. Thanks for having me. It was a lot of fun. Yeah, great. Okay, guys. So remember, I've got everything. I'll have it up for you on the show notes. Check out Bobby's link. And then while you're over at my website at angieginsler.com, make sure that you also check out the 2019 social media content calendar. It's now available and ready. And it is 365 days of social media post ideas planned out for you. So it's going to save you a lot of time next year. And then if you love today's Freedom Friday interview, you want to be notified every time I go live with another entrepreneur, make sure that you follow and like my Facebook page so that you get notified each time that I go live. And then remember, perseverance, not perfection is the key to success. I'll see you guys next week.